Welcome to another episode of the Stellar Sound Podcast, the only podcast dedicated to astronauts, all the while rocking it on all the interdimension space traveling radars to empower creative musicians everywhere. I'm your host, Liane Paulson, and, I'm, and today I'm joined by Sertip. But first, to become part of our interstellar presence, find us at the Stellar Sound Podcast.com on all social platforms at Stellar Sound Podcast or join our astronauts in the Stellar Sound Community Discord server. Links are in the description. Serendip is a Bangkok-born Swedish Thai experimental trilingual vocalist and multimodal artist. From her early beginnings performing in jazz lounges in Stockholm to her musical adventures in the North Pacific, Serendip has become one of the, of the formative female voices in the contemporary music scene, blazing the trail for all artists driven by the passions for intertwined, intermotive and conscientious compositions. A lot of C's in that sentence. Wow. Serendip, welcome to the Stella McGinnon and how are you today? Thank you so much, Leonri. I'm doing well. I am really happy to hear it. We were like pre-recording. We were just discussing early morning recordings. And so luckily not too early morning where you're at right now. But we we both have it, have had it where it's just yes. been too early. So we're in the golden zone of time zones right now on both sides. I'm really happy. But we're really happy to have you here today. And I can't wait just to dive into everything because I find your musical journey so interesting and so just creative. And I know that's the most basic and simply word, simplest word to use, but yeah. Thank <laughs> you so much. <laughs> uh, and like, let's just start out with the humblest of jazz beginnings. Um, I like that you on your website mentioned Diana Kroll as an inspiration. Um, and how you said jazz was initially uh, like a moment for freedom and finding your identity and, and experiencing it. Um, and when I think of jazz, and I'm as a musician, I hate saying this out loud because I know people get so mad, but jazz to <laughs> me is such a, a, a genre or a, such a musical style that's loosely based in a fixed structure. And what I mean with that is, of course, it has a foundation, it has a structure like all musical styles do, but you can do whatever you want with it. <laughs> yeah. um, mm -hmm. And and the best way I like, oh, I, oh, not the best way, there's this meme where a cat falls <laughs> on the piano and then this is like this overlay that says jazz. <laughs> and that's the meme. And I want to know what about this strange style was so liberating and that allowed you to express your freedom and your own identity and why did this genre grab you? I think it might have come from, I started actually playing classical music, both violin and piano. So I grew up in Bangkok and Thailand, and it's very common that Asian kids start on the piano and on the violin. So that's where I started too. And I also played Thai traditional instruments. But I think that when I was finally exposed to jazz in my teens, it was so liberating after having years of being told yeah. to play exactly what's on the page and what the composer oh, wow. wanted me to do to finally be like, you know what? It's not about what's on the page. It's about what you bring to the table. And to me, that was li really, really liberating after needing to play exactly what is there. Every the time. fixed structure. That's, yeah. a, that's probably, I love that you put it that way because same. <laughs> I've also been classically trained and it was so not, I didn't explore jazz at all. Unfortunately, I wish I did, but it's true when you are studying classical music, even just as a child, the beginning phase is like, you have to play every note, every phrase, every tempo to the precise thing that is so boxing. And I think that's where a lot of kids actually lose their love for music because it's very rigid yeah. and straight. Um, and I think for me too, I was, especially as a kid, I was dealing with so much performance anxiety and mm. being classically trained, we would have these like piano competitions and yeah, you, I had a Russian piano teacher and she Oof. very much made sure that like I could not play anything wrong. And I think oh, that wow. coming from that too, of then going to jazz of like, you know, if I mess up, but I can make it musically, then that's my version of it. And that was so liberating. That's a, that's a very nice way to put it. I was wondering, I, I like to ask people this, that start in a certain genre, like if you're a metal artist or a hip hop artist or a jazz artist, what was the, if you can think back, what was the first jazz song that made you go, oh, I really like this. <laughs> can you remember? <laughs> jazz song. That's a tough one. 
that's a tough one, right? Like I, I can't remember that. a song. I can just remember the artist. So for me, I was so drawn to Dana Crawl because mm. at that time I was playing piano and I was also singing. To then see an artist do both at the same time and then add just... her own, you know, spice to it, making it her yeah. own way for me that was mind blowing. But then from Dana Crawl, I started to dig deeper and I discovered Ella Fitzgerald and you know yeah. Louis Armstrong and. Carmen McRae and Betty Carter and, and Bobby McFerrin. And yeah, it was totally like mind blowing. But I also remember that I really loved Diane Reeves and I had discovered her pretty oh, early yeah, on right. too. And what I really loved about her and I think has really informed my way of performing jazz and arranging was the arrangements of that she did of standards. So she would not just play a standard like normally you read the head and the chords and yeah. you know have typical beginnings and endings she would actually yeah. have really fleshed out arrangements and i really love that and the same thing with esperanza spalding too oh wow that oh, okay. yeah okay <laughs> makes sense <laughs> um i want to just um ask you a bit about competitions because mm -hmm. One big one that you part in was the Thelonious Monk International Jazz Competition. And to an outsider, when I think that, it's like someone telling me they did the NFL halftime show, basically. It's, <laughs> it's on that level, right? And I think, why, why, yes, this is insane, first of all. Congratulations, second of all. Because that competition is so big in the world, especially in the jazz, in, forget yeah. the jazz world, in the music world. It's really big, and it has like launched careers, like uh, uh, like Chris Porter or uh, uh, like Gretchen Parlato. If I can like just throw out some names over there, uh, and to think that you get the call, you're a finalist, you can partake in this. What is the mental, the physical, the musical prep that goes into getting yourself ready for this competition? You know, Leandri, I wish that I could give you a better answer, but the entire, the entire experience was happened so fast. Yeah. So um, I just moved to New York in August of 2015 at the end of it. And like two days after I moved to New York, I started school, Manhattan School of Music for my master's degree. Yeah. And during the orientation week, I was just talking to other students and they're like, yeah, this Flow and Mon competition is happening. The deadline is next week. You should totally apply. And I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> okay. And you need like an up-tempo song, a ballad, just you, you need five different songs. I don't remember exactly the requirements. Yeah. So I just literally asked students who had just met a few days earlier. We went into a rehearsal room and we just recorded these songs and then I submitted them. And then I needed to go back to Sweden to move out of my apartment. And yeah. as I'm trying to like get everything out of my apartment, at 3 a.m. in the morning, I get this call. Hey, you made it to the competition. I'm like, ah, ah. you know, and I was there with my best friends and I, we were just yeah. screaming and crying and it, it was insane because I, 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 everyone told me like, you, you can't expect to get it. It's so hard to get. Yes. Yeah. So I was, I was not really expecting it. And, but it happened and I was so happy about it. But at the same time, I really need to get my stuff out of the apartment because it's going to fly back to New York. <laughs> I was so, going to, I was going to yeah. ask you, is there like one word you could use to describe the experience? I feel improv is going to be so funny. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was definitely improvisation. And I think the biggest takeaway is yeah. always like, you should always be ready because you never know when you need to do something be on that stage at the competition i mean it, it can happen exactly that, and uh, um i after the call i had one month to prepare and again i just moved to new york so then i was trying to move into my stressed. apartment here and open up an american bank account get an american phone number like they're just understanding american culture there was so many other <laughs> life things going on and then at the same time trying to prepare for this I competition just... and going to school and but the no. good thing was I studied <laughs> with Gretchen Perlato. She was my vocal teacher. Oh, really? Yeah. So okay. she was able to guide me and she was like, just stay true to you and mm -hmm. do what you feel like is showcasing you the best. 
Okay. Um, so I, I brought my own spin to the table and I brought some crazy arrangements, which in hindsight might not have been the best idea because I had a 10 minute rehearsal with the band who mm. performed with us at the competition. So that's like a 10 minute rehearsal for three songs is three minutes a song. <laughs> it's not a that's- lot of time. I'm going to be honest with you this is not the answer that I expected from that question. I was like yeah I had like months and then I did this and then I you know took yoga and or like Mm-mm. meditation and no. <laughs> no. It was not just the boom, boom boom boom. <laughs> yeah. And That's and crazy. I did and I did not win. Um but I'm happy about that too because you when had that you experience yeah. I had that experience. I got to perform for Didi Bridgewater, Al Jarreau, and like <sighs> Quincy Jones was there. Herbie was there. It was, it was insane. Um, but the point okay. of it all is that when you apply for the competition, you need to sign a record deal with Concord. So in case uh-huh. you win, you need to put out an album with them. And because I didn't win, I my I had like open options. So after the competition. I met up with Michael Lee who's the band leader of Snarky Puppy and then yeah. he offered me a contract with Ground Up Music. And I mean that's just been yeah the the stage for you if, if you it's will. It's been my family. It yeah. yeah. So th- in in the end we did not win but we did yeah. win. Yes. <laughs> no, exactly. That that definitely counts. Um when I think about your music though and once again also your teaching your albums your entire style artistry style the first thing that comes to mind is it always has some type of cause and i say that with a lot of respect most of your collaborations projects do have some it's not just a song to put it that or it's not just a musical piece there's a reason for it it's very a very conscientious way of writing but one thing that stands out of everything that stands out to me was and I'm going to butcher this name and I apologize but the Skuru Festival and from oh, Sweden. Oh, Skuru Festival, yeah. There we go. Okay, great. You said it much better. <laughs> you said it properly. <laughs> um I want to quickly just touch on that. Um mm-hmm. from the description online it says it's a free festival for equality and anti-racism and the anti-racism society in Skuru Sweden. Um what was the catalyst for this because i know you were one of the creators or collaborators with this what was the catalyst for the creation of this festival so um in sweden it's a different type of um, education system than in the us and i think maybe in some european countries they might have this too but um i think it's mostly in scandinavia it's called a folk high school and in the us you would kind of compare it to a pre college but it's different because it's not happening while you're in high school it's literally a school you go to after high school before college and it's usually in the middle of nowhere and you just go there for two years and for my school and my um jazz uh, program that i went there we had 7 hours of ensembles a week and then okay. you would just live in this place with all your classmates. There were like 20 of us um, in the middle of nowhere. And there's a music studio and rehearsal studios that's open 24 seven. So all you do every day for two years without distraction is to practice and to write music and to play with your friends and to learn and grow. It's like boot camp, but extreme. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it, it was so amazing but because it was placed in this very small town uh, outside of Malmö which is in the south of Sweden yeah um it was a very small town and unfortunately there was a lot of um prejudice against people who are not native Swedes uh. so one day when um, me and my friend who is from Ethiopia we were going to the grocery store there were guys just driving by and stopping in the car and yelling at us. Mm. Um, another day when me and my friend, we were trying to go to the grocery store again. You know, there's nothing else to do in this town but to go to the grocery store. <laughs> Could um, do groceries. <laughs> then th- there were other people driving by in the car and they would throw eggs at us. Um, oh, wow. And for me, 
you know, I understand that for them, like they see all these people who are not from there coming to the school and living in their community and saw us as a threat. So yeah. I decided to create that festival to just invite the town in so they can see we're super friendly. We just want to be friends with you and make some music and art and you're welcome to enjoy it. So I created the festival and made it free just because of that. And I also had like the... um elementary school in the town mm -hmm. perform do a band oh. <laughs> thing do a dance thing i had some other local musicians perform and then i brought some bigger headliner artists um she was, there was actually uh there was one group that i'm kind i can't remember their names now um do you know the name of the band uh when they say i don't care i love it yes I don't... <sighs> yes why can't I remember their names? Oh, I'm going to just um, climb on the internet immediately because that's going to bother me so much. But they were there. No. Oh. I, I got an opportunity to book them, but I they were too expensive. Or I decided to not focus on them. I went with another artist, which his name was Tingsek, and he's also incredible. Icona um, Pop. Icona Pop. Anyways... I got an opportunity to book them and I did not. And that's also one of the biggest mistakes of my life that I didn't <laughs> book them because it was right before they like blew up with that song. Yeah. 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 It, was a, it was a, so close, but okay. That's, that's the thing we can look back on a learning, a learning, <laughs> <laughs> a learning yeah. period. Also, um, it was a very small budget festival, you know, because it was all raised by ourselves and it was free to the public. And but, it's a small, it's a really small town from what I could gather. Yeah, I, I think know. there's like 20,000 people there. Yeah. yeah. Um, I hate to ask this, and I'm really hoping for a positive answer, but is it still ongoing, the festival? Has it died out? Um, yes. Uh, I think in the past year it happened. So every year now the students of the school, they put do it, it on and do it. Yeah. But there's Obviously. been some years that the students don't do it, but most of the years since then they have been doing it. I imagine during COVID, obviously as the rest of the world, <laughs> but, yeah. um, but Sarah, okay. yeah, that's, mm -hmm. I would like to move on to a segment called behold the meteor shower. This segment is a set of rapid fire questions that you will have to answer with the first word that comes to mind. So it's non-canceling, <laughs> non-canceling, relatively easy questions, but you know, sometimes we get interesting answers. So, mm -hmm. I'm going to just ask you, are you ready to behold the meteor shower? Okay. I okay. apologize for any <laughs> misspoken things ahead of time. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Here we go. If you could be any instrument, which one would you be? <laughs> First one, right Am at I the on gate. the clock? Um, I would just set up a timer real quick. No. I would probably be the voice. The voice that is an instrument so that yes. that it works it works spongebob or patrick um i don't really watch spongebob you're the fourth person in a row that said that like the first <laughs> i think season two's first that was like they nailed it with like i want to be this one and then the second half and you're the first episode for season three but like they like i don't really watch it which is interesting. It's a dying cartoon, I think. No, it's not. I have been meaning to watch it. I just haven't watched it yet. But my husband loves it. He loves it. Okay, we can yeah. you can post the interview. I think ask him to describe you as a Patrick or or or, or his son. <laughs> okay. I don't know if that's gonna be great for your marriage, but you know. <laughs> okay. Do pineapples belong on pizza? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Which movie has the best soundtrack? Um, I would say The Joker. The Joker? Yeah. That's an interesting choice. It's a, yeah, okay. I can get yeah, behind that. Yeah, I, I believe I'm going to butcher her name, but I'm pretty sure her name is Hildur Gunnarsdottir. She is Icelandic and she wrote the score for it. There's a very big upcomings of female composers in film these days, which I'm loving. I mean, they've Me always too. been there, but they're getting the big, the big ones they haven't is. really been there though there's not that many and there's still like the majority is men i think only two percent of film composers are women i'm just happy and whenever i see a, a female's name they're like yes yes yeah um which ooh, where was where is my okay there we go which friend's character are you 
can I pass on this one? I haven't watched it so long and I can't remember their names. It's it's fine. <laughs> so, like I asked the friend this the other day just for the fun of it. She's like, I don't remember the names, the blonde one. I'm like, most of them were blonde at one stage. <laughs> right? Um, best musical advice ever given to you? Um, music first. That's music what first? I, yeah. Like you Ooh. should always focus on the music first. It's so easy to get caught up in like music business or administrative Politics. work and all the other things. Um, but yeah, it's music first. Music first. So smoothly awesome. transition yeah. into a next talking point that I would like to discuss with you. And it's your composition techniques. So I'm going to be very honest here. I feel that I follow music composition I'm going to say this with a grain of salt, trends relatively well. If there's a way of composition, compo compositioning, composing, um, I feel like I know about it. But then you and one of our stellar sign members, Zorana, has introduced me to a new one, which is data sonification. So, and I was just like, data, what the, what the, what the, what the? <laughs> and then I had to go look it up and like just do a little research on it. And it's, it's, it's a really interesting way of composing. And you use a lot of composition uh, techniques and processes. Like you use you use the uh, the uh, a pedal effects with your voice, and you like to mix elements of different genres, like especially with the jazz and the pop and everything. But this is a very futuristic one, and I love that on your Instagram you do have a video where you kind of simplify it and kind of break it down for us. But for everyone watching slash slash listening, what is data sonification? Well. Uh -um. Let the sun if you show sun. Uh, no, but um, <laughs> give us a free masterclass while you're here. <laughs> well, you take some. Uh, well, so I th I think the simple answer to break it down is that you can take any kind of data set and then you translate it into pitches. And if you're very mathematical, then you can do that math of if you have, let's say, you have seven values. Yeah. And you have seven pitches. So then one value gets one pitch, the other value gets another pitch. But um, with the data that I've been doing recently, um, I was on a research vessel with um, 25 scientists in the North Pacific. Yeah. And on this research vessel, they have a real time camera machine called ISIS, and it's spelled I S I I S. Yeah. Um, and that video captures all the planktons in the water in real time. And then it also can process everything it sees and turns it into data. And there's so much data. Yeah. I might I not remember the the numbers completely because as you know, now I'm bad with names <laughs> and I'm bad yeah. with numbers. <laughs> but they were telling me that every day they have eight terabytes of data. Wow. There's Look so much data. Lot. Yeah. And I asked them on the ship if they can give me some of the data so I can do data sonification with it. And to get the data for 1.5 seconds, it was like over 3,000 rows of values yeah. in um, Microsoft Excel. <laughs> so that's a lot of data. So then when you're doing data sonification with that, yeah. um, you might want to expand your notes so mm -hmm. I, for that i work with multiple octaves okay yeah. um in order just so i don't have only like that i'm going through three thousand values of data and i can only put it on seven notes that if i have more octaves then i actually have a wider range and with mm. data subtonification it's just a tool to be able to comprehend the data and like i said with all this data that I was processing when you look in Excel and you just see all these numbers it's so hard to digest but yeah. when you turn it into music you can actually hear when the values go up or when the values go down and it's much yeah. easier to comprehend and if you think about any song I don't even know how many notes I have in a song but somehow the brain has an easier time organizing it when it's a pitch than when it's just numbers yeah, right. Um, you, I think in one of the Instagram posts about um, your time at Odyssey, see, you did uh, showcase this a little bit in your in your uh, dual project. It was like I'd never thought of it this way, and I never yeah. realized that the brain does this. 
in but the Instagram yeah. video where you were like uh, breaking down data certification, you said that what you like about it is that it allows you, it, re- it allows you to write songs with a deeper meaning, and it also mm-hmm. reduces the stress of starting from scratch. Mm-hmm. Um, which, I mean, it's great for any songwriter everywhere. But I want to know, how did you discover data certification, or who, who enlightened you on this world for the first time, and then? When you wrote your first composition using the sonification, did it go the way that you would hope or did it sound just completely shit? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's like... a great question, Leonri. So actually for me, um, that video that you're talking about, that was when I broke down the rising global temperatures. That was from mm-hmm. NASA's website from yeah. 1980 up until 2012. And um, how I got into it was because I wanted to write a song based on this concept of rising temperatures and um my whole concept of the my album carbon that just dropped today yeah (laughs) yeah um was that i i wanted to make sure that i'm not putting everything in the lyric i didn't want the lyric to be the storyteller i wanted the music Mm -hmm. to be the storyteller Mm -hmm. so i was like what if i just go to nasa's website and do some research and then i found this set of data i'm like what if I could put it into pitches and yeah. um, I was Googling and then I found this um, com- computer like browser app called Two-Tone where you can input any type of data. So I inputted the data from NASA's website into Two-Tone and then it would just play chronologically from 1880 up until 2012. And okay. if you've ever seen the graph of um, the rising temperatures, you can see that it goes pretty much the same. And then at the very end, it's <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's kind of like how the, the data sounded too. It was like, and to me, it felt very expected. And mm-hmm. like you said, I don't think that it sounded like shit, <laughs> but I did feel like it, it didn't, it didn't emotionally grab me. Yeah. And okay. for me, that's, that's an important part too. I think it's very important that my music can stand alone by itself and for people to be able to appreciate it, even if they don't understand where it's coming from. So yeah, it, I decided to kind of like to choose my own years that are significant to me and significant to our world and build patterns of that. And that's how I tell the story. So the piece that I wrote is actually jumping around different years yeah um, just to make it a little bit more musical and emotional Emotive. yeah but, okay emotive. that's just great segue because i want to i really want to get into this um time in the north pacific because it's not just the you didn't just randomly jump on a boat and there you were like hey can i use your data it wasn't a thing um <laughs> it was it was a something you applied for it was a the sit uh, can you, I'm going to get this right. The Sitka Center of Ecology and Art uh, had a program called Artists at Sea, and then you apply, you get nominated, and you were one of two out of something like 120 or something, right? That's... Yeah, there were 120 artists who applied, um, and I was one of two for this year. And then there's yeah. going to be two more next year. So in the fall of 2023, we're going to have an exhibit where we're presenting all our work that we did on the ship. Um, and then the question is, of course, what is this? Why are they taking artists onto ships with scientists? Yeah. yeah what so, is this? Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the term STEM in the U.S. It's for the education system. Mm-hmm. Um, and now they're starting to understand the importance of arts and how the arts can help communicate, especially science. So they're turning temp- STEM into STEAM. Yeah. So um, it actually helps for the science programs to get funding um, from the National Science Foundation if they have an arts component. Okay. That's amazing. Um, All the videos and all the posts and all the little sound bites, or I say sound bites, like it's just like a corporate uh, music that (laughs) you guys made there is really, it's so fitting to the footage that is also posted of it. Like I said, when we were talking about the sonification, it's so interesting to see the videos and how it directly translates onto music and how it just runs parallel. It's like such a um, symbiotic relationship. It's so strange to actually see that. And the things that came from there are, it's, 
You wouldn't expect it to be so good on the ear. You would expect it to sound just weird, honestly. But it's it's so musical. It's it's weird. <laughs> Your brain doesn't want to comprehend it. Um, and of course, uh, you're right. While you were on board, you guys were just busy. It was creating compositions, creating uh, sounds for the playing things, um, taking video footage, creating music soundtracks for it. it you guys did, as you said, AR and VR uh, uh, mm-hmm. um, compositions for it. Um, and then you, I love how you say, and I want to get into this because I, I cannot comprehend this. You said, this is one of the most creatively inspirational moments in your career slash life which I get if I look at the footage because it looked amazing. But then you see this data, you see this footage, you work with these inspirational scientists and fellow artists and everything. Great, very inspirational, backing you on that. But then you go back to the tiny little cabin studio that you guys created in the hull of the ship and you've worked long hours. How do you maintain that inspiration and that feeling of creativity afterwards because <laughs> if i had to in personal opinion if i had to work that long hours in that conditions and go back to that cabin i would be like eh. yeah <laughs> well um actually the um me and the, the vr artists and the lead scientists we were so-called floaters yeah. so <laughs> we did not have a rigid schedule the the other scientists they were um uh, divided into two teams where they need to work from 3 a.m. to 3 p.m. and 3 p.m. to 3 a.m. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But we could just jump in anywhere at any time. So I never, I, I didn't work for like 16 hours a day. I probably worked for 14 or 15. Okay, yeah. That's pretty long. But my point is it's for me, it's, it's yeah. fun because it's a different type of work. I think if I only needed to do one thing for 14 hours, I would be exhausted but I got to change the scenery all the time of mm. I would go and help these uh, scientists sample whatever is happening and go and count the different jellies and put them in bags and look at the footage and, you know, and then I would go down to the basement and work on my music and then I would go up again. And then one of the uh, scientists, Alejandro, he would teach me you would like give me a science lesson <laughs> oh that's awesome that's very cool yeah so <laughs> yeah no it, it felt so varied and that's why i had the energy to do what i did that's uh that it makes it sound much better than i pictured everything i honestly was imagining you guys being just hauled in this tiny little cabin and in white walls <laughs> <laughs> i mean the, the ba- i mean the the studio was was tiny but to be honest with you i did not even expect to have my own like music office i thought i would have a small table somewhere and stuff but i got to have a nice monitor i had like a real mouse and a real keyboard (laughs) and then my musical keyboard and i had my microphone and every time i wanted to record i could shut the door so for me it was it was a studio at set up basically i'm just curious this is like completely i want to say off book or something but (laughs) You had your mic there for because you did add vocal elements to the mm-hmm. recordings, right? I'm imagining that the echo and the noise was difficult to work around. Oh, was it, yeah. Curious, well, how was the how was the sound of engineering for that? <laughs> I love that you asked this question. So, um, on the ship, there was a constant hum from the engines, yeah. and. For the first few days, I wrote everything in B-flat. And I did not understand why I wrote everything in B-flat. Until one day, I'm like, let me see what pitch that hum is. And it was a B-flat. Oh, (laughs) you were being influenced. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, wow. Other than the hum, at least at the bottom of the ship, there was no other sound. And I brought this dynamic mic, so it didn't take up a lot of the hum. You can hear it. um, But my... I brought it more to just record like scratch vocals. Um, yeah. I still have a lot to develop and finalize, and that would be on a real microphone. So another of the, I'm okay. going to say, interest, interesting, that's a word, uh, more interesting projects that you've done in 2021 is your project with Fantastic Fest, where you were um, given the project of scoring a full film, but not just mm-hmm. any film, 
1925 silent film, The Lost World, which is, I can't, if you ask a real f- a, a film junkie, that's like, it's an iconic one. It's one of the, the, the starting points to most, I'm going to say, adventure films. Um, yeah. And I'm going to, I hope I offend no one, but there is this mindset to, I want to say normal people, like the musicians are abnormal, but to normal people, that <laughs> if you're a pop, in your case, mostly jazz, or let's say you're a general musician, that's the wrong word, but you're a general musician, you write a certain type of music, and where you're a composition, a composer, sorry, you write a certain type of music, and if you're one, you can't be the other, and vice versa. Um, and even though some people put it in their bio as both, they're always known for one or the other, which we know as musicians, it's not true, but okay, let's just go on with this trend. Um, <laughs> so I want to know, coming from a songwriter framework, what were some of the challenges that you had to take on when scoring a full film, film for a uh, um, a silent film, for example. What were what were some of the things that you didn't expect to be challenged by? Mm. So I think um, for me, it was actually that I I got asked to do this commission to write for the Lost World through my label. So the uh, Alamo Draft House Fantastic Fest asked Ground Up Music to ask five artists to write music for the films, and being a singer, like you mentioned, and being a songwriter. And using my voice with electronics, I felt a lot of pressure that that's what people were expecting of me. Ah. And when I was watching the film, um, and I was trying it out at first, to me it just didn't fit. And like you said, it's such a legendary film. And it's such a great film. And I also watched some of the previous scores that had been made for it. And mm. The previous scores to me, some of them were kind of distracting. They weren't really like if there was a slow, really emotional scene, the music was doom, 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 and it's like, Quirky. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's not what's happening on the screen. So I decided actually to go an orchestral route because that's what I felt like the film needed. And because it's such a legendary film, it's a shame that it doesn't have its own score. Yeah. So I kind of decided to to step aside as Serintip, the artist with weird mm. electronic vocals mm-hmm. and step into like a full film composer role. And there are some some parts in the film where I do use my voice, um, but it's kind of blended yeah. in with the rest and it's also a, with it's electronics, it's hard to hear. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think the, the most challenging thing, because I've never scored for film before, was a it was 105 minutes that's a lot of music a lot I had of music three <laughs> months to do this and um with no previous experience so the first month i just needed to like how do you score for film so i was on yeah. youtube <laughs> just learning. and also just yeah. technically in my software program a logic how do you line up the music with the video and make sure the music doesn't move (laughs) because if there's a gunshot or something and i'm hitting it perfectly but i don't know how to lock the audio to the film then it would not be perfect so there is like technical challenges like that and then i wrote the the score in about six weeks so i needed to write five minutes of music a day in order to finish on time and if i didn't (laughs) yes it was a it was yeah, I've never needed to write so much music in such a short amount of time. Jeez. And if I did not write five minutes of music a day, the next day would have needed to be 10 minutes and 15 mm. minutes. And that's hard because it would take me maybe five, six hours to write five minutes or more. So what you're saying is after these three months, you were exhausted. <laughs> I was exhausted. And um, that last month was actually just trying to make all of the virtual instruments because I did everything in the computer. There was oh, yeah, no yeah. budget to have a real orchestra. The orchestra. Mm. So I needed to go in and write in all the expression and dynamics and do everything by hand to make the virtual instruments sound as oh, wow. real as possible. It's great. I must say, I listened through it and I um, I watched the film as well. Uh, I Yay. To YouTube align them. <laughs> um, oh, you're, there's, you, you can watch it on Amazon. Oh, I should have watched because it. I should know that. Yeah. But it's, or Alamo, it, yeah. I love it. It really gives a, a, a bigger life to the film. And I want to 
also just go back to that because when we think, like you said, when we think of silent films, but especially with Lost World, but in general, silent films, they always have some type of orchestral piece over it that's either just quirky or doesn't make sense, or it's just some Beethoven thing that someone put over it and pops your uncle, basically. And it doesn't fit the emotive or doesn't fit the message of the film, let's put it that way. Um, and generally, when we do think about film composing and the process behind it, we always hear that the composer had the opportunity to sit down with the producers and directors and go through every tiny facet of every tiny frame. What do we want to hear here? What is the message? What is the emotion, etc., etc. And that, that the composer composes, director says yes, no, 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 what, what, what. And that's how a soundtrack is composed. But you can't sit down with the director of this film, obviously. No. So you've already told us you had to go, you just, you had a thought process. You don't want to make it into a vocal thing. You wanted to make it orchestral, et cetera, et cetera. But what, what elements of the film stuck with you that allowed you to portray the visuals within the music, if I can put it that way? How did you bring the director's story into the music? Because the music that you wrote is so fitting for this film. Thank you so much. Um, that means a lot. Well, I, I think I, I was very influenced by John Williams and also like, I love movies. I felt and, John Williams. I felt him throughout that yeah, so and, hard. <laughs> and if you think about the old movies, like the early 2000 movies, they all have scores and they're really letting the music be the third lead character. Because if yes. you think about Star Wars or Jurassic Park, any of these big movies, they would not be the same movies without the Up. fitting yes. scores. And, you know, nowadays, a lot of films, they just have songs that are being licensed. So it's mm -hmm. like they make the film and then they're like, okay, let's put a Taylor Swift song here or let's put a Billie Eilish song. And there's no marriage between what's happening on the screen yeah. and the music. Um, so for me, I decided, I watched the film, I think three or four times and I drew out the lead characters. So I was like, okay, Ed Malone, how does he sound like as a melody? Hola. <laughs> the, these, um, the, um, the brontosaurus, what would yeah. it sound like as a melody? The, you know, so I, I went in and gave each character its own melody. And then I had that as my like foundation material Basis. that I use over the entire score. And I would just use different arranging devices of like changing the key or changing the tempo, changing the time signature, putting in a different instruments. Yeah. Even back to basics. Yeah. Like, all the way back to basics. That is interesting because it's very, yeah, it's exactly as you put it. We see a lot in film today. And um, one of our previous guests, Dean, we had a long conversation about this, that it's, it's basically cover songs or just the original songs within movies. Mm -hmm. It's very, you don't see, not epic, but you don't see epic soundtracks anymore. Soundtracks that are so part of the film that you can't separate from the film. Like you said, it's, it's not a marriage between it. Um, so I was so happy to, when I was listening to it, I was like, oh, yes, love it. So congrats Thank on that, you. man. Congrats. But, Thank you. It was okay. so fun. It's so gosh. much work. So much work in this room right here. I was just like, three months, she was dead. <laughs> I got my blue light glasses, though. <laughs> I think that's a good decision after <laughs> Yeah, a lot of screen um, time. <laughs> uh, but... I want to go on to a section that is our stalker section of this podcast. Uh, <laughs> and I always say that this is, should be a crime. It is probably in somewhere in the world. And someday someone's going to pull me out on this. But I like to go on social medias of guests and then mm -hmm. just check out. Because I feel that you get the essence of the artist through the social media or the, the behind the scene look to it. So um, I surfed, let me just use the Stella, Stella terminology. I surfed the Stella again and I found some interesting posts on your Instagram page. Um, and then just for all the astronauts listening, please head on over to our YouTube page or our Discord server community to have a look with us. So I am going to successfully share my screen. Okay. Hopefully. And then I'm going to show you some pictures I found. And then I just want to like know, give me some behind the scene context if you will uh, <laughs> do you see that oh <laughs> i love okay. the glasses love the glasses <laughs> <laughs> what where okay. how and why 
<laughs> so uh, I think this was back in 2000. Based on the jack, it's probably 14 or 15. So this is right before I moved to New York. Oh, yeah, I think yeah. it was right before I moved to New York. And I just needed some like, because I was like, oh, I'm going to move to New York. So I need something to show people when they meet me and they don't know who I am. And I wanted to look the way I want people to perceive me. Yeah. Um, so I did this photo shoot with a friend who is in a great uh, producer and pianist, Erik Jonasson. He's Swedish. And yeah. we went to the Swedish um, um, uh, amusement park in Stockholm called Gröna Lund, where a lot of artists have performed. Yeah. And um, we just did a photo shoot there. And uh, yeah, I got some cotton candy. <laughs> Maybe and look. like vintage glasses and um, uh, the sweater and the yeah. leggings are from a really cool Swedish designer called Love A Lot. And I loved all the prints that she made. And then the I, jacket, I don't remember where that's from. A really cool photo though. Um, Thank you. I like love the glasses. Oh, why does not one? Oh, there we go. Ah, there we go. But isn't it? Yeah, this is the next one. Let me just uh, zoom in. This is definitely a big show. I think that is you over there. Yes. It's <laughs> bowing down. Um, where is this? And what concert was this? This was in Berlin. Ah. I believe the venue was called eWork. Mm -hmm. um, unless eWork is in Cologne. I'm so sorry. Everything kind of like <laughs> blends in my brain. Everywhere. Blurs. <laughs> yeah. But um, this was in November of sorry october of 2019 and i was asked to um, open up for snarky puppy yeah so you can see michael lee there on bass and mark letter on guitar and then justin stanton on keyboards he's behind michael lee he's a little hidden yeah. he's bowing yeah. too it's just me and justin bowing <laughs> and then uh, oh, wait, there had, he is <laughs> yeah and then yeah. we had ross peterson on drums ross peterson was actually the original drummer of snarky puppy ah yeah yeah it was a, uh, well, it seemed like a great show. It's quite packed in there. Um, this is yeah. a space for anyone. That's really cool. Um, I'm assuming this was for <laughs> Lost World. No, no, no not yes. that we've spoken about it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So uh, as a part of my research phase before I started writing, I went to the National History Museum to look at all the dinosaurs to really get a feel for how they would sound. Oh, that's cool. Just a little in real life inspiration, right? <laughs> I'm assuming this is you. I hope I don't have a picture of a random child on my computer, but um, this is you, right? <laughs> yes, this is me. Yeah, and I'm dressed up as Pippi Longstocking in Swedish, yeah. Pippi Longstrump. Um, yeah. She was a big inspiration for me growing up. And oh. that's probably also why I started to play jazz later on in life, because she does everything her way. <laughs> oh, I was like, is there some ja jazz version of her that I don't know? <laughs> I was really confused no. for a second. <laughs> no, just her essence of her character. Just a sassiness. I love the sassiness. Um, <laughs> the wig is the wig. It's the wig for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for me too. <laughs> love it. It's so cute. Um, I love, I love this picture. I don't know for what it is, but I love it. It's so, yes, that's all yeah. I can It's okay. so classy. Tell me all about this. <laughs> okay. So, um, um, obviously I learned to sing jazz in my teens. And then I continued to sing jazz, and that's why I moved to New York to sing jazz. And uh, back in the day, I did a lot of traditional jazz competitions. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my first jazz bands, it was called the Thai Queen and the Kings of Swing. <laughs> <laughs> the Thai Queen and the Kings of Swing. Yes. Nailed it. Yes. Oh, wow. Uh, that's a name. <laughs> That is a name. <laughs> uh, yeah. And this band was the, the development of that. And it's called the Vipers Orchestra. So we would have five horns playing these like big band arrangements, but for five horns instead. And mm -hmm. we would perform and we would always dress up really nicely. Fancy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, I'm, I'm starting to get back to this version of my jazz diva self. So now I'm performing <laughs> quite often at the Amman, New York. Mm -hmm. and they have a jazz club there in the basement and probably one of the best sounds in the city. So when I'm not doing electronic weird pop music, <laughs> I'm singing jazz at the Amman. This is such a 
this this picture has such a mood to it. <laughs> I love it. I really do. It just this is what this is what I picture when I picture ma- a j- jazz musicians. I couldn't say it now for a second. It just it's just it's classy. It gives me 1920 feels. Yeah, you know that's what we were going for. And this is actually my aunt's old apartment. So this was her dining room. And, no. Um, and the top right corner, the little boy in the picture frame, that's my uncle. Yeah. And then the no. guy to the left is his dad. And then the person in the middle was his grandfather. You have a lot of influences from the jazz community that you've spoken about, uh, from your time with Snorky Puppy, from your vintage clothing, from everything. <laughs> but uh, what most people do know about you, you do have a very, I almost said eccentric, you have a rich cultural background. You are Swedish Thai, born in Bangkok. So it's just, it's a hotpot of cultures and influences. And especially with the, the Scandi and the Thai, it seems to me, it's two very opposite spectrums of the world or spectrums of culture. So what I would like to know from you is, how does your Thai side influence you? And how does your Scandinavian side influence you? And how are they alike? Mm-hmm. Because it's two very different ones, right? Yeah. Um, so I think, I guess I'll start with the similarities that they're both yeah. very humble cultures. Um, both Thai people and Swedish people don't really take credit for the things that they do. And, you know, they're very kind and modest people. Um I would say that the Thai influences obviously comes through in my music with the Thai language and also on carbon with Thai tuning and Thai instruments. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And um, my Swedish influences, I think I have to thank them for allowing myself to be fully exploring my creativity to mm-hmm. the fullest extent. Um, in Thailand, when I was studying there, it's a very type different type of education system where it's very kind of like fact based. Yeah. Um, there was not a lot of room for the students to think for themselves or to have any kind of essay questions or elaborate. It was very much like checking boxes. Basically. Yeah. Um, and I think culturally that's often the case too, that Thai people are, I want to say, I don't want to say force, but they're encouraged to work inside the box. Yeah. Versus in Sweden, it's all about think outside the box. Like how far can you take this? And it's a very, very progressive culture. Um, So I have the Swedish side to think for my weirdness. (laughs) (laughs) Everything non-typical that I do. Thank the um, Swedes. <laughs> yeah. Ex- I've mentioned a few so, experiences and a few collaborations, and we've previously talked of other experiences that you've had in your career. But if you have to think back through your lifetime as a musician, what experience stands out to you uniquely? Musical experience or any experience? Any experience. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> Why do you make it so hard for me, Leandri? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Give me some kind of guide. I mean, I can't. I've I've, I've lived for like three decades now. I have a lot of experience. They asked me the one that goes like, ah, that was the one. <laughs> <laughs> um, This is the rapid fire all over again. I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the heat. Well... <laughs> I guess maybe moving to New York and really making that leap for myself because before I moved to New York, when I was studying at the Royal College of Music in Stockholm, I was also working as a production coordinator at Fashion, which is the jazz club in Stockholm. Mm-hmm. And I met a lot of artists who came through and a lot of them were Americans and lived in New York and, you know, had their career here. Yeah. And, um, I obviously love that and I learned so much from being around them and hearing them perform every night. Yeah. But there was um, one night where one of my big role models um, who I'd been looking up to my entire, like since I was a teenager. And um, she asked me if I wanted to become her manager. 
And when she asked that question, I think that was the moment I realized that I had focused too much or I've been like worked too much as a production coordinator and being on the other side of the stage. And that if I wanted to have my own musical career, I needed to really make that a priority. Yeah. Um, so that kind of like pushed me to take the leap to move to New York. And, um, I've been very, very happy of, of daring to cut the ties of any kind of safety net and just moving to a new place, not knowing anyone, not knowing how anything is going to turn out. And as you heard in the beginning of this <laughs> conversation of like, Formative I'm dealing years. with moving and then I'm just like this mom competition and blah, <laughs> you know? So like, since I moved to New York, I feel like my life has really moved in the direction that I want to take it completely flipped around if it, if it describes like that. I mean, it sounds yeah. like that New York was the starting point to everything for where you are now. Um, the record label, the snarky yeah. as well with your style. It seems it was, it was, it was the catalyst if we can put it that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. What a good uh, thank that. you for joining me at the Stella Sound podcast today. But before we go, I want to give you a chance to shout out any platforms or projects um, but before I give you that opportunity, remember to go follow us in the Stella Sang Discord community or head on over to Instagram for the latest Stella updates. But Sarah, the floor is yours. Any projects, platforms you'd like to shout out? Well, I want to give a shout out to my team. Um, yeah. So uh, <laughs> Nolan Bird, my co-writer and drummer and husband and Nick Hard, my co-producer and uh, King Shakat, which is my keyboard player. He's also Thai, so he does all the Thai tuning on Moog synthesizers on this album. And uh, Nicha Totong, which is the visual designer that we talked about. Um, Michael League, who is the bass player and also my music artistic consultant for the album. Ground Up mm -hmm. Music, Ropa Dope, who put out my album. And uh, Lydia Liebman, who is my publicist. And the uh, Asian American Arts Alliance, New York Foundation of the Arts, STEM, um, the Swedish Cultural Council. Yeah, I think that's Too it. Long. Amazing. And Couldn't have groups. done it with them. I mean, really. And they, you do feature a lot of them on your pages where they give us little behind the scene looks into every facet of what they created with the album, uh, especially your, your collaborators. And I mean, the most amazing people honestly their mindset their work ethic their chat the other approach projects is just it's it's next level it's truly just a different way of thinking but listeners and fellow astronauts out there from me Leandri Paulson and my guest Sarah if we want to thank you for joining us here at the Stella Sound podcast but the countdown has begun and it is time to blast off into the stratosphere remember to empower creative musicians everywhere and we'll meet again at the next Stella Mediator.